What's up guys, welcome to Q&A Mondays. I'm Thad Barnett and we're back with our Uplift Q&A series. This is episode two of the series and we're gonna do a deep dive into wind uplift testing. And I've got Jeff Hawk from the Sheffield Metals Technical Department. Thanks for being here, Jeff. Absolutely. We've looked at these tests before, but we're gonna do a deep dive into some more of the specifics and technical information when it comes to these tests and what they really mean. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of uplift testing that's available for roofs and walls and other parts of a building, but they all have something in common. And what is that, Jeff? What do they all have in common? Yeah, so I mean, they all have in common is, you know, they're basically testing to see, you know, how much pressure a roof can withstand. You know, some tests do that better than others. Some, you know, measure and they stop at a certain goal. Some take them to failure. But, you know, the idea of it is, is, you know, to basically see how much force a roof can withstand. They all end up having a pressure. When we talk today, we're going to talk mainly, you know, outcomes and design pressures, right? But you really get two pressures with all these different tests that we're going to talk about. You get ultimate pressure or you get a, and you get a design pressure. The ultimate pressure is basically the highest force that the roof withstood. But then you have a design pressure, which includes a 50% safety factor. So you basically divide that number in two. And that's what you use to design with is the design pressure. They do that, obviously, for a 50% safety factor, you know, to make sure in case something isn't calculated just right, you know, they've got a pretty good buffer in there as far as how a roof should perform. So all the pressures are measured in pounds per square foot. You know, again, you know, for an example, if your roof fails at 100 PSF ultimate pressure, that, you know, equates to a 50 design pressure. And usually they're measured in negatives. They'll call it a negative design pressure, a negative 50, a negative 82. So what types of uplift testing is out there for roofs? So there's a couple main ones. We're going to talk about three of them for roofs. Uh, there's two governing bodies that make up these tests. The first one's UL, which is Underwriters Laboratories. And then there's ASTM, which is American Society for Testing and Materials. The two for UL is the UL 580 and the UL 1897 test. Those two kind of go hand in hand. They're used over different uh, testing applications. And then the other one that we're going to talk about is ASTM E1592. It's a structural test. It's a little bit different. We'll talk about that uh, a little later. But those are, those are the three main uplift tests for roofing systems um, and the two governing bodies that you know set the standards for them. Gotcha. So let's start with the UL 580 test. What is that? So UL 580 test is basically for roofs designed over solid substrate. So you have a decking, right? You have a plywood deck, a metal deck. It's designed to be installed over a solid surface. A UL 580 consists of three different classes, UL 30, UL 60, UL 90. And once UL 90 is completed, the UL 580 test is over. The three classes have five different phases that make up each class and each class lasts for 120 minutes. They simulate positive pressure pushing on the underside of the roof. They simulate negative pressure pulling from the top side of the roof. They simulate oscillating phases where basically you have negative and positive pressure pushing and pulling on the roof, getting a bouncing effect that we've seen in a couple of our other videos. This test specimen that you build is basically 10 foot by 10 foot. And that same specimen is used for each class as you continue through the test. So you build a 10 foot by 10 foot specimen exactly how it's uh, supposed to be installed. You test it to UL30. Once UL30 is completed, you use that same specimen to test for UL60 and then again for UL90. So by the time you've completed UL90, that one specimen has actually gone through three different tests where it's had strain put on it at three different times. UL30 is the beginning, UL60, the pressures get a little higher, UL90, the pressures get higher than that. We consider UL90 to basically be the minimum test standards for anything that's going to be installed. So if we're looking at a project, you know, for our weather type warranty program, and they don't call out design pressures or uh, any specific testing requirements, we always install per a minimum requirement of UL90 because best practices, long-term roofing, we want something, you know, saying that the roof's going to perform to at least a minimum UL90 standard if nothing is called out specifically. What do those numbers actually mean, UL30, UL60, UL90? Does that, you know, have any bearing on what the panel can actually do? So those are just the phases of the test. UL, UL90 doesn't mean 90 miles an hour. It doesn't mean 90 pounds of pressure. 
UL90 is actually a negative 52 and a half design pressure or a 105 ultimate pressure. So they do correlate into ultimate and design pressures that can correlate into wind speeds. The name of the test or the name of the phase doesn't correlate into wind pressures or, or wind speeds. So UL90 doesn't mean a 90 mile an hour rating. It just means that you completed UL90. So when you reach UL90, is the 580 test over? The 580 test is done at the end of UL90. Okay. Or if it doesn't pass before then. Right. Yeah. So failures, right? So let's talk about that because failures are going to be pretty much the same across all the roof tests that we're talking about. Failures include seam separation, uh, clip disengagement. It can include kinks in the vertical legs of the panels, a kink the size of a quarter. Your roof, your roof test is over. Even though everything will still t- stay attached, your test is pretty much done. All right, so let's move on to UL 1897. What is that test? So UL 1897 is the continuation of the UL 580 test where they basically take it to failure. Again, same specimen that was used to complete the UL 580 test is now uh, basically used for the UL 1897 test, right? So you've had this one specimen that's been under a bunch of strain already. What they do for the 1897 test is the goal is to blow it up, right? They want it to fail. They want to see the max it can go to before you get a failure. Uh, What they do for the test standard basically is they keep uh, the positive pressure, the pressure pushing on the underside of the roof at a constant, and then they increase the negative pressure, the pulling action on the top of the roof, usually in 10 to 15 pound increments. You have to sustain those pressures for one minute before they bump it up to the next highest pressure. And basically they just keep doing that until the roof, either the panels disengage, clip comes unattached, or, you know, it gets to a point where the roof, uh, roof has failures due to the, the actual panels themselves. Usually this is where we're going to see panel disengagements. We're going to see disengagements, uh, and find out what the actual failure mode is, uh, you know, snap lock systems, 99% of the time, the snap lock's going to disengage, right? Before something, a clip pulls out. Uh, mechanically seam systems, you'll usually see a clip pull out or you'll see uh, the panel get a kink in the seam because, you know, at 180 degree seam, it's probably not going to come unlocked. So there's different modes of failure, but it's all the same test method, right? And, and you know, the goal, you know, there's there's been times that we've done testing on certain aspects where, uh, you know, the, the test machine, the, the the test chamber can't go up any higher in pressure in those cases, which is great because, you know, you, you just withstood a ton of pressure. Um, but in those cases, your test is over as well. So we know with the UL 580 test, you're trying to get past UL 90 to give you that, you know, that kind of mark of achievement. With the 1897 test, you know, what are those numbers telling you? What do you do with those numbers? So those are the numbers you really want because you want to see how much your roof can withstand. You know, if you stop the test early and you don't move on to the 1897 test, you get a UL90 rating, which is good and it might be acceptable. But usually, you know, for most parts of the country, especially anywhere along the coast, you're going to need something better than a UL90 rating, you know, to meet the wind speeds and design requirements that are out there. So if you're doing a UL580 test, more than likely you're going to end up doing a UL1897 test to go with it because, you know, everything's already built. It's already in the test chamber. You might as well go ahead and blow it up and see see how well it does. And, you know, there's big differences on how different panel systems work based on the panel design itself based on whether it's attached to plywood versus metal decking based on whether you're attaching to three ply plywood to four ply plywood. You know, there's a lot of different uh, scenarios that create different outcomes in the testing, right? So it's good to know what those differences are and, and how you can achieve, you know, different pressures based on your environment. Three ply plywood is probably the most common plywood used. You know, but we have testing over four ply plywood for some areas in Florida because four ply plywood has better pullout values, right? So where four ply plywood might not be needed in, you know, Oklahoma or, you know, middle America, four ply plywood in Florida is pretty common because of the test requirements and pressures they need to meet. So having the different options and knowing the different ways you can uh, do the testing is always is always beneficial. At Sheffield, we try to test for the minimum standards because you can always do more on your test reports, right? So if I test over three ply plywood and four ply plywood is being used on the job, well, four ply plywood is superior to three ply 
I can still use my engineering and everything's good, but you can't do the opposite. You can't go backwards, right? So if I test over four ply plywood, I can't install it over three ply plywood because the pullout values aren't the same. We try to get the best results possible using the, the minimum requirements because again, like I said, you can always do more, you can't do less. And it's important to note that when these tests are being done, they're all being tested specific to a panel profile, a panel gauge, a panel width, the substrate they're being attached to, and at a specific clip spacing. When you do a test, all these different things come into play. And again, you could do more, you can't do less. So if I have my clips at two foot on center, I can't go to 36 inches on center. I could tighten it to 18 inches on center and I'm still okay. I got to do at least what the test calls for. So both those UL tests were over solid decking. You know, what is ASTM E1592? 1592 test is a structural panel test where you could think of UL580, 1897 more as an architectural panel, right? Because you have a structural deck that you're attaching to. The panel in a 1592 test is actually a structural panel because it's the only thing separating the outside from the inside of the building, right? So um, most of the time this panel is tested over purlins that are uh, steel and you do different purlin spacings for this test just like you would do different clip spacing. Usually the 1592 test, you're testing a panel over purlin spans at one foot and five foot and then the engineers that are performing the tests will give you different design pressures um, for, for the, all the spacings in between. So if you test at one foot and five foot, you pretty much got calculations for every spacing in between that one foot and five foot. Main difference it's a structural panel test, and the test chamber is a lot larger because most purlins are sp spanned at five foot. You have to have so many attachments for the test to be valid. So your test specimen that you're attaching to is 24 foot long by 12 foot wide because you have to have enough room for those purlins to be spaced at uh, five foot in order for you know to get a proper test done. You know, so you're talking structural panels. You know, what types of panels are those? So usually it's going to be a two inch mechanically seam system, at least for Sheffield. It's usually going to be a two inch panel or better. You know, we have seen the inch and three quarter at closer purlin spacings. I personally am not a big fan of walking on snap lock panels over open framing because I want something a little bit better than a three eighths inch lip of 24 gauge metal separating me from the ground. But it's usually what's considered structural panels. Usually it's two inch, two inch tall rib heights and above. You know, other other manufacturers out there have three inch tall mechanically seam panels, things like that. It's definitely not residential panels that you're going to see installed over open frame. So this 1592 test, you know, is it similar to the, is it more similar to the 580 test or the 1897? Are we trying to achieve UL90? Are we taking it to failure? What does it look like? So you're definitely taking it to failure. Um, similarities are, you know, it uses positive and negative pressure. You get a design pressure and an ultimate pressure. It's measured in pounds per square foot. While you can say you get a design pressure or an ultimate pressure that is the same as UL90, you can't say you have a UL90 rating, right? Because it's an ASTM test and UL90 is an underwriter's laboratory term. People, we use the term interchangeably because it meets UL90. Well, it meet, that means it meets a negative uh, uh, ultimate pressure of 105 pounds. Right. But there is no UL90 rating in an ASTM test. This, the goal is the same. It's to see how much positive and negative pressure the system can take before it fails. And all the same rules apply as far as failure modes. Same rules apply as far as the requirements for when you use the testing. Panel type, panel gauge, panel width, clip spacing attachment, type of clip, type of fastener. All that, all that remains the same. So speaking of clips, fasteners... Uh, deck type, you know, how do the roof components and accessories factor into the testing? You can't go out and use a test report that was tested with X clip and use Y clip because that wasn't what was used in the testing, right? You know how the testing clips going to perform with the system because you did the testing. If you try to use that same testing with a different clip, well, you're not comparing apples to apples. Same thing with fasteners, right? You, you use a number 10 by one pancake head fastener, you can't use less than what you tested with and, and expect to get the same results. You might get lucky and get the same results, but it's definitely not something I would count on. If you test at a certain clip spacing, that's the clip spacing you need to use or it needs to be tighter. If you go further apart, you're, you're, you're not providing a tested system. 
All right, Jeff, well, thank you very much. We've got two more Uplift videos coming your way, so stay tuned for those. Comment down below if you have any questions. Subscribe here to the Metal Roofing Channel. As always, I'm Thad Barnett. We'll catch you next time.